you, Father. Well, Father, we just thank you tonight for your holy written word. We thank you that the word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We thank you, Father, that as we approach the word of God, we do so with hearts that are ready to receive from you. Our desire, Father, is that the word will permeate our hearts and, Father, that it will transform our minds so that it can transform our life. And so we thank you for the impartation that we're going to receive tonight. We protect our heart from anything that the enemy would try to do to steal the word away from us. And we say, not tonight, devil. You're not going to get the word out of me tonight. But the word is going to be planted in my heart. And as a result of the word of God, I can decree and declare that my life will not be the same. And so we thank you for this, Father. In the matchless name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen and amen. All right, you can be seated. So glad y'all braved the, the, the storm and the, the sleet and the whatever that is outside. You're here, and we're going to put the word in you tonight. Is that all right? All right. Well, we're going to go into the word of God tonight. We're going to start out looking at Deuteronomy chapter 8. There's some things we're going to talk about tonight, but we're going to talk about the benefits of doing the Word of God. And the reason that we're going to go here is because we're talking about growing. And we understand that the seed is the Word of God. And anytime there's a seed, you know, if you think seed, you need to be thinking simultaneously about growth, right? There is no growth without a seed. Everything starts out as a seed. And the Bible clearly tells us that God's word is the seed that he's designed to be planted in the, in the soil of our hearts so that we can grow. Amen. Amen. And so we're going to start tonight looking at the benefits of doing the word of God. But we're going to look at Deuteronomy chapter 8. And we're going to look at quite a few verses of scripture. But I want to start in verse number 1. And I'm going to say this to you. That what I'm saying tonight is not going to be anything new it's going to be something that you've heard before. It's going to be something that's going to be repetitive. But how many of you know that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by God's word? And so, you know, you know, I say a lot of times that faith doesn't come by having heard, but it comes by a continual position of hearing. I want to hear the word. I want to be transformed by the word. And so as I hear it, even if it's something that I've heard before, I'm going to hear it again. How many of you had a steak before? Who's in here? You ever had a steak? How many of y'all still having steaks? Mm-hmm. You know, I know some of y'all started, you know, you started out eating steak, but now you may be vegetarians. How many of you ever had some greens in here? You've had some veggies. You still eating veggies? Yes. Why? Because we understand what's necessary for our growth. You don't just kick it to the curb. You keep eating it because it's designed for you to grow, right? And so I want you to think in that context where the word is concerned. We keep planting the word in your life so that you can see fruit in your life. Amen. And I just want to honor the pa all of the male pastors are in the house tonight. How about that? That don't happen often. You know, I was starting to feel a little salty. I'm like, where are the pastors getting an attitude? But I'm glad they're here. And Pastor Dana, we're so glad to see you. She's out doing a thing. I said, the male pastors, you're here, but the male pastors are not always here. So I just give honor to the men that God has called to be over this house. And I'm so thankful for them. Pastor Steve, and you know, we don't forget about you. You always here. You got us, Pastor Steve. All right, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse number 1. We're going to be looking in the New Living Translation tonight. And so I want you all to follow along with me. If you don't happen to have a New Living Translation of the Bible, look at the screen. It'll be up there. But this is what it says. This is God speaking. He said, be careful to obey all the commands that I am giving you today. Then you will live and multiply and you will enter and occupy the land the Lord swore to give to your ancestors. I'll read it again. We're going to kind of take it like we did uh, John the 15th chapter, verse by verse. We're going to take it and look at it again. Be careful to obey all the commands I'm giving you today. Then you will live 
and multiply, and you will enter and occupy the land the Lord swore to give your ancestors. Thank you, Curtis. When we look at this verse of scripture, if you look at the word live, it's the Hebrew word hayach. And it signifies having a life that's sustained, one that's made alive, a life that's healthy, a life that's prosperous, a life that's free from sickness, discouragement, disease, and death. This is where they get the word nothing missing, nothing broken. Life. He said, if you carefully obey all the commandments I'm giving you today, then you will live and multiply and you will enter and occupy the land the Lord swore to give to your fathers. He's saying, if you pay attention to what I said, what came, what came out of my mouth, that's when you're going to have the God quality and the God quantity of life. You're going to live with the character and the nature of God in the earth. It's what we call Zoe, the God kind of life. Now, when you look at Zoe, again, it means nothing in your life is missing and nothing in your life is broken. What kind of life would we live if we just live conscious of the fact that God wants my life to have nothing missing and nothing broken? If you were to do an assessment of your life, if you saw things missing, if you saw things broken, you could stop and say that in that place in my life, I am not experiencing the God quality of life. Amen. So then the question then becomes is then are you, you know, go back. Are you paying attention to the commands of God? Because he said the t simultaneous response to you paying attention to the commandments of God is that you're going to live, you're going to multiply. That's what he said. You're going to enter and you're going to occupy if you pay attention to the commands of God. And so God told Moses that he would live and he would multiply. The word multiply is the Hebrew word rabah. And it means that you will exceed, you will increase numerously, and you will be enlarged. See, I don't know how anybody can look in the Word of God and not see increase. I don't know how anybody can, can look in the Word of God and say, it's not the will of God for believers to increase in life. It's clear that God wants us to increase in every area of your life. Right? Right? He said, I want you to multiply. I want you to exceed where you are, to increase numerously and to be enlarged. This is what God wants for your life. But living and multiplying is the result of something. You don't get to live and multiply and do you do what's in front of the then. And a lot of people want to put the cart in front of the horse, but you can't do that. You have to do the first part first. Say first things first. first, things first. The first part is you being careful or mindful to obey all the commandments or the words of God. You got to be careful, mindful, watchful that you are obeying what God said out of his mouth. So you're living and you're multiplying. In other words, your success, your prosperity in the God kind of life or the God quality of life, your rise to the top is totally a result of you obeying the word of God. Now, it's not just money. It's not just physical things. This prosperity first impacts your spirit. It's you being made whole spiritually, then intellectually, and then physically and materially, right? That's what it is. Total life prosperity is God coming into your spirit. And that life of God that's in your spirit then moves itself out of your spirit into your intellect, into your way of thinking. And you know as well as I do is when your thoughts change, then your life changes. What does the word say? As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. That's where you're going. Where you're thinking is where you're going. And so it's important for us to understand that God is longing and looking for our life to be inundated, our minds rather, to be inundated with prosperity. 
spiritual prosperity, intellectual prosperity, and physical prosperity. Why? Because he wants your life to look like him in the earth. Remember the reason that the, 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 uh, the nation of Israel, the size of New Jersey, is located in the place that it's located is because God wanted the nations of the world to see this is what you can look like. This is what your nation can look like when you submit yourself to my ways. And so he wanted all the nations of the world that were coming in and going out and doing business with that area to see who is that nation? What is that little nation that's the size of New Jersey that's prospering the way that it is? What is this nation that has a land flowing with milk and honey? What is this land that the pomegranates and the, and the grapes are so large that it takes two men or a group of men to carry the grapes out of the land? And I want you to know the grapes are sweet in Israel. What is this place? It's the place where there's a people who have made up their mind that they're going to live their lives based on what God said. It's a powerful thing. And so like Pastor said the other day, you know that we are called to be a light. And God wants, like the nation of Israel was set apart and this little nation set off somewhere, he wants your light to shine so that the world can be drawn to it. He wants your life to be an example of what it's like to serve God, to walk with God. He wants your grass to be the greenest grass on the block. Amen. He wants your house to be the nicest house on the block. Why? Because he wants people to be drawn to you, not just for the purpose to say, oh, you, you know, you got, a, you got a lot of stuff. But it's so that they will come to you and say, what is the root of your success? How did you get the way that you are? And he wants you to be able to say, it's because I made the commitment to live my life based on the word of God. And what he has done for me, he will do for Amen. So this is the life that God wants for us. But living and multiplying comes as a result of feeding on God's word. Amen? Amen. Amen. So let's keep reading. Deuteronomy chapter 8. We're going to keep on looking at it. You know, I, I broke it apart when I was looking at it. He said, be careful to obey all the commands I'm giving you today. Then you're going to live. Then you're going to multiply, then you will enter, then you will occupy what I swore to give to your ancestors. Now, you can't stop at just living and multiplying. There's more. There's the entering in, and then there's the occupying. God has that for you, too. And I realize that this was written to the people of Israel, but we can take this text and use it to show us just how God desires to bless us when we pay attention to the word of God. The Bible says that we have a better covenant, and it's established upon better promises. In other words, even though God said this to the children of Israel, he's saying to you and me that I've got a whole lot better for you. How many of you know better is better? Amen. Amen. Let's look at Hebrews, the eighth chapter, verse number six. Hebrews chapter eight. It says, but now Jesus it's up on the screen. If you don't have it now, Jesus, our high priest has been given a ministry that is far superior to the old priesthood. For he is the one who mediates for us a far better covenant with God based on better promises. Now, this is a very important scripture for a lot of reasons. One, it's a, better, it's, a, it's a scripture that's important to us because God wants us to understand that although the law, you know, was good in its own way, what I've given you under the new covenant is better than what they had under the old covenant. So all of the blessings that you might find under the old covenant, what I've given you is multiple times better under the new covenant. And so we have to be careful many times not to be trying to combine what God wanted to do under the old covenant under the new covenant. We got a better covenant and it's established upon better promises. Now when this was spoken, 
This was under the old covenant in Deuteronomy chapter 8. And so here he told them, I'm going, I'm going to make you live and I'm going to multiply you. I'm going to make you live. I'm going to multiply you. You're going to enter in and you're going to occupy the land. And so that was under the old covenant. Now, that's a blessing in and of itself. That's something that I could stop and put my dancing shoes on just that little bit right there. But we have a better covenant established upon better promises. So he said that you're going to you're going to do better than just live. You're going to do better than just multiply. You're going to do better than just enter in. You're going to do better than just occupy. What's better than that? Amen. 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 This is the word of God. And so this is the, the, the testament to how God wants to bless us, how he wants to increase your life. He said, I will give you abundance for your life. I will multiply you, meaning that I will expand your territory. You go on your job and you got, they got you in a little cubicle. You know, you might start out in the mail room, but then eventually you're going to end up with an office with a window. Won't he do it? You don't know where God will take you. You might start out with small things, but because the word of God resides on the inside of you, the seed of God's word will grow. And as a result of the seed of God's word growing on the inside of you, it, your life has no choice except to yield and submit itself to the growth that's happening on the inside of you. Amen. Amen. But you got to stay in the word. You got to look at the commandments. You got to keep your eye on the commandments. He said, I'm going to increase you, meaning I'm going to make you larger than you are right now. Not in size. Those of you saying, oh, me, I don't want to gain no more weight. That's not what he's talking about. He's saying he's going to make your life larger. He's going to stretch your life out so that you're not just affecting me and my, but you're moving out into a place where you're affecting more people, more lives. For the kingdom and the glory of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so, you know, when I looked at this, I saw a fourfold blessing just in verse number one of Deuteronomy chapter eight. He said, if you do the word of God, I'm going to give you life. If you do the word of God, I'm going to multiply your life. If you do the word of God, I'm going to make you enter a promised land, a good land. If you do the word of God, I'll make you occupy the land that you enter. In other words, you're going to take possession of territory. Amen. 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 Now, that's important because no place you can go, there's no place that you can go and not have the ability to live the blessed life. Because wherever you go and the word of God is on the inside of you, that word is going to produce increase in your life. You think about when the Ark of the Covenant was in Oba-Edom's house. The Bible says that when the Ark of the Covenant was in Oba-Edom's house, all of e Oba-Edom's house was blessed. Why? Just because the Ark of the Covenant, which contained the Ten Commandments, sat in his house. That's the power of the word of God. And you think about it today. Today, you are the ark of the covenant of God. Today, you are the carriers and the containers of the word of God. Today, the commandments of God reside on the inside of you. Amen. Pastor Amen. Skip said they're written on the tablets of your heart. Amen. Amen. And so you're the ark of the covenant of God. So this is important. There's no place that you can go and not increase. There's no place you can go and not increase. There's no place you can go and not increase. I remember there was a day I was walking and, you know, the enemy tries to attack your mind. And I just started saying out of my mouth, every place I put my foot, I will increase. Amen. Every place I go, I will increase. I remember one time I was in a conversation with one of my former pastors and um, something was going on, and I turned around to her, and I said, God has always blessed the works of my hands. God has always blessed the works of my hands. Why? Because I attend unto his words, and I incline my ears unto his sayings. I don't let them depart from my mouth. I keep them in the midst of my heart. Why? So that they can be life when I find them in health and healing to all my flesh. 
Amen. And so God is saying, my word is going to take you into a land of blessing. And it's not going to just stop with just getting in the door. The word is going to cause you to get in the door. And then when the word gets in the door, it's going to cause you to set up camp, to occupy, to take possession of the wealth of the land. In other words, you're not just coming in to come in. No, because the power of the word of God is on the inside of you. Like Bill Winston says, you come in to take over. We don't come to blend in. We're coming to take over because of the word of God. Amen. And so all of this is going to happen when you choose the first 12 words of the passage to be careful, to obey all the commands that God has given to you. That means that you've got to form a relationship with your Bible. You got to form a relationship with your Bible. And a few weeks back, we went back and we started talking about the fact that the Word of God is the person of Jesus Christ. The Word is Jesus made, Jesus is the Word made flesh. And so in essence, what you're doing is you're coming into relationship with Jesus Christ when you come into relationship with the Word of God. When you say, Father, I want to know you more, what you're saying is I want a deeper relationship with the Word. The one and the same. And so when you understand that the the, the deeper you go in your walk and in your relationship with God's word, the deeper you will go in your relationship with God himself. And as a result, the, the measure of the word of God that you receive is the measure of God's word that's going to increase your life. Little bit of word, little bit of increase. Medium sized word, medium sized increase. Whole lot of word, whole lot of increase. And I'm not talking about just reading and devouring all of these different verses of scripture. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about you taking one verse of scripture because one verse of scripture has the power to transform your life. You take one verse of scripture, something that God has been dealing with you with, and you muse that over in your mind over and over and over again. You say it out of your mouth. You meditate on it with your mind. You put it on your window. You put it everywhere you can you talk about it you sing it you think it you speak it you hold conversations about it that word is getting deeper in your heart and that word is increasing in your life and as a result that word is putting pressure on your natural life causing your natural life to change are y'all listening to me today the word of God God is saying to us Take my word and pull yourself out of every rut that you ever been in. Take my word and pull yourself out of the financial bondages that you've been in. Take my word and pull yourself out of the emotional ruts that you've been in. Why? Because the word of God works. Amen. Amen. Look at verse number two, what he said about verse number two. And thank you for keeping the scriptures up there. Look at this. He said, remember how the Lord your God led you through the wilderness for these 40 years, humbling you and testing you to prove your character and to find out whether or not you would really obey his commands. Now, look at this. God is saying here, remember how I led you through the wilderness. For us, through those difficult times. Remember how he led you through those difficult times. Times when you felt like you were all alone. He said, I did that. Notice he didn't say, remember how I led you into the wilderness. He said, I led you through the wilderness. Right? The wilderness represents times of emptiness, times of being barren and broken, times when your bank account has tumbleweeds rolling through it. And God was saying, I was with you and I led you in those times. Satan is the one that brings you to those places of wilderness. He said, but I'm leading you out of, I'm leading you out of them and I'm leading you through them. You think about it, the children of Israel for 40 years, God was sending them through the wilderness to see if they would really obey his word. If they would trust him, if they would believe him. And just like he did with them, he's doing it with you. He said, I'll trust in you. He's doing it with you. Will you trust me? If you remember, stay with me. 
the wilderness was supposed to be a shortcut until they got into a place of disobedience and it became the long way. But they obeyed him and he said, this is the shortcut. This is the quickest way to get to that land of promise. But they got there and got to a place of, I'm not trusting the word anymore. I'm not trusting God anymore. I'm leaning on my own understanding. And that short trip became a long marathon. Mm -hmm. And it's the same with us. God will lead you to a place that you're supposed to go through quickly. But you get there and you start thinking about how it should be done, the best way you think it should go, how you feel it should happen. And now that quick trip now becomes a long marathon. You got to stick with the word. It's the word that will lead you through. Not you leaning on your own understanding that will get you through. Mm -hmm. But we do it so often. I just needed God enough to get me here. I got it from here. Amen. Amen. He told the children of Israel, I led you through the wilderness for 40 years, humbling you to see if you would resort to the word of God, to what I said to you or what you learned in Egypt. Will you, do er like, do, will you do everything like everybody else or will you stand with me and stand on my word? He led you through the wilderness allowing you to be tested to see if you would respond to what's written or respond to what's in your flesh. He led you through the wilderness to prove your character, to see if what's in you was made from his word or whether it was coming from your lower nature. You see, it all goes back to the word of God. Notice that God could only get so far through this passage before he brought the focus continually and consistently back to the word. God's word is our life. It's where we operate in the earth like him. You see, the trip through the wilderness, as Pastor Skip said, for the children of Israel wasn't just about them getting out of Egypt, and it wasn't just about getting Egypt out of them. It was more about whether or not they would blindly trust God and act on what he said. He wanted to know, will you take a step even if you can't see it? Will you walk in the direction that I'm guiding you even if you see trouble ahead of you? Will you trust me? That test, that trial, that hard place in life, how you get through it will depend on the measure of the word of God you choose to live by, you choose to meditate on. Are you going to do the word or are you going to do it your way? What are you going to do? Who are you going to respond to? God? His word or your flesh. Amen. Amen. To grow, all of us are going to have wilderness experiences. We're all going to experience times of proving and testing our character and our heart. God wants to know what's in your heart. He wants to know what you're made of. Amen. Are you going to trust him? Are you going to stand on the word? The word of God was never intended just to sit in your head like a trophy. I know that scripture. That's not what the word was intended. It was intended to get in your head to transform your way of thinking so that it could change your life. Amen. And so we need to get back to meditating on the word of God because the word of God penetrates the mind and collaborates with the spirit to produce a transformation that nothing on else on earth ever could. Amen. Amen. Let's look at verse number three. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse number 3. Now look at this. He said, yes, he humbled you by letting you go hungry and then feeding you with manna, a food previously unknown to you and your ancestors. He did it to teach you that people need more than bread for their life. Real life comes by feeding on every word of God. Now, this is where Jesus got that scripture from where he said, man shall not live by bread alone. When he was talking to the devil, when the devil tempted him and said, if you're so hungry, turn this stone into a piece of bread. Jesus was quoting this scripture right here. He was saying that man, man is not to live by bread alone. Real life comes by feeding on every word of God. And yet we find ourselves, if you were to do a survey of your life, you could ask yourself today, how much time have I spent thinking about the word? How much time have I spent speaking the word? How much time have I spent looking at the word of God? 
if you can say zero to none, that's, that's the measure. That's the measure that you're going to get back. If you haven't spent any time feeding on the word, thinking about the word, meditating on the word, singing the word, or whatever it is, however it is that you get the word in you, you can't expect to produce a harvest where there's been no seed planted. What farmer with good sense goes out to a, a field expecting to receive a harvest in a field he's never sown any seed? You don't have a right. You don't have a right to expect a harvest when you've never sown any seeds. But when you've taken the time to plant the seed of God's word in your heart and in your mind and in your life, you have an absolute right to put a demand on the word of God and to put a demand on the things that you need. Amen. Amen. You know, I thought about this, but the translators of the Bible translated the Old Testament verses in the causative sense and in many places that should have been in the permissive sense. And there's things that were written about God that he didn't do. It said God did this, he killed them, he did that, and that's not an accurate way of translating it, you know, it was God permitting a lot of things that have happened in the Bible. And so throughout the years, God's gotten the blame for a lot of things that were really the work of the enemy. It was really the work of the enemy. Their own actions and disobedience opened the door for the enemy to attack them. And God comes on the scene, but he got the blame when he got there. Right? What God is saying to us is, hey, if you do this or if you do that, and that's what we've got to learn about God. God is not a father that's saying, now, I'm, I'm, don't do that just because he wants to be in control of your life. He made everything. And so he understands the consequences that will come to your life when you do something. And so if God speaks to you and says, don't do X, Y, Z, it's because he loves you and he knows what the fruit of that thing is going to be. But I want it anyway. Well, you're going to eat the fruit of it. And then when it happens, then you can't get mad at God and you can't blame God. Because I told you, it's like, you know, me coming to you saying, Skip, is wet outside. Well, I'm going to go see. Well, you're going to get wet. That's what's going to happen. You just, you just got to see. You know, one time my son, my oldest son, when he was coming up, he was a teenager, and he said to me, why can't, you just, why can't you just let me learn things the hard way? And I said to him, I said, you're saying that. Now, I'm going to let you learn the hard way. You saying that, you don't really want that, but I'm going to let you learn the hard way, and I'm going to step back and let you figure it out. And when I tell you he learned the hard way, he learned the hard way. And there's some things that he's going through today because he wanted to learn the hard way. We don't have to learn the hard way. When God has given us his word, all he's saying, if you just obey, if you just do what I tell you to do and make the word of God the first and final authority in your life, what's the first thing you look to? It needs to be the word of God. Amen. So he said to them, he said, I fed you. Well, I don't want to get into that. Let's go to verse number, number uh, four. Deuteronomy chapter eight, verse four. He said, for all these, he's still talking to the children of Israel. For all these 40 years, look at this. Your clothes didn't wear out. And your feet didn't blister or swell. So you should realize that just as a parent disciplines a child, the Lord your God disciplines you to help you. So obey the commandments of the Lord your God by walking in his ways and fearing him. So now look at this. For 40 years, they experienced God's supernatural provision. Imagine wearing the same thing for 40 years. And it looked just like it did when the Egyptians gave it to you. For 40 years. Now you figure that out. Because of the word of God, the word of God sustained them to such a degree that he gave them a pair of shoes and for 40 years, not one pair of shoes wore out. You know what that means for the children? It means that the shoes grew with the feet. They 
were not in a place where they could receive provision. There was no cobblers around them. There was nobody to make shoes for them. And so everything grew. But he talks about their shoes. Feet never blistered. And they walked around the same mountain for 40 years. They took a 40-year walk and never got a blister on their foot. And their shoes grew with their feet. What is that? Why? Why was that? Because the word of God surrounded them. God spoke to them. That's the sustaining and the provision of God's word. And when you take God's word, no matter where it is that you are, the word of God will provide for you if you pay attention to it. You attend unto his word. You incline your ears unto his saying. You don't let it depart from your heart. You keep it in the midst of, from your eyes. You keep it in the midst of your heart. You trust in the Lord with your whole heart. You don't lean to your own understanding. But in all your ways, you acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Are y'all listening? A lot of people think that everything in your life needs to change for the word of God to work on your behalf, but it does not. God can work miracles with what you are and what you have right now. What you have in your hand right now, what you know right now, God can use it to transform your life. But you got to get it to the word of God. You know, and I'm going to close with this because it's time for us to stop. You know, one time the Lord said to me, that every place that you turn, I want your eyes to be looking at my word. Now, I, you know, I'm, 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 I'm endeavoring to get back to that place in my life where every place I turn, I'm, you know, I get up in the morning, the first thing I look at is my Bible. First thing I'm looking at is the word of God. I go to bed at night, the last thing I'm looking at is my Bible. Because he said, day and night, you are to meditate on the word of God. And so I'm getting back to that place in my life where my heart is longing to be filled with the word of God, to listen to God's word, because I realize I'm not supposed to live by bread alone, but by every word that's come out of God's mouth. And so when you make a dedication to commit yourself to God's word, that is when you're going to see results. Now, is everything going to turn topsy-turvy once you start stepping toward the word of God? Yes, prepare yourself for that. Yes, prepare yourself for that. The enemy is going to come. What is his goal? It's to take the word that's been sown in your heart. And so he's going to come with thoughts, ideas, suggestions, and situations to pull you off of the word of God and to be able to say the word is didn't. I tried that. It didn't work. But see, you can't try the word. You have to do the word. You have to live the word. You have to stay in the word. You have to make a commitment to the word of God. This is not some flimsy decision that we make. No, this is a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle that we choose to live our lives based and harnessed by the word of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's stand up. I only got to page one. Father, we just thank you for the word of God. Come on, just think about the word right now. Think about the word, the word, the word of God, the life that's in the word. And even if you're not familiar with the life that's in the word, trust those of us that are. I'm telling you that God's word will transform your life. It'll make you into the person that you desire to be. It'll change your marriage. It'll change your relationships. It'll change your financial uh, situation. It will change everything about you. It'll change your job. It'll get you in a different place. It'll, it'll move you from one career to another. The Word of God will transform your thinking. And it'll just make all things new. And so, Father, today, we yield to the Word. And it's our desire, Father, to receive and to grow, to be able to look at the Word because the Word is a revelation of Jesus Christ. And Father, the good news is about your Son. 
And so our desire is to know him in a deeper way. And so we thank you that we can. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. There's a song that's just come up in my heart that I would love for Curtis to sing. You know, and we said Jesus is the word and we understand that he's the word, but to think about Jesus, and we used to sing this song years ago, but can you sing that song? The words are Jesus, Jesus. There's something about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus. Like a fragrance, isn't that the word how it goes? After the rain. Thank you, Father. Jesus, 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 there is something about that name, Master. Jesus He is like a fragrance After the rain We call you Jesus 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 Let's just bless him. Lord, we're so grateful. Thank you for the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. We thank you for that name, Father. We glorify you for the name of Jesus. Come on, let's bless that name. Come on, pull it up out of you to bless the name of Jesus. Father, tonight we bless you. We praise and magnify you for the name of Jesus. There is no name like that name. 
We're so grateful that healing is in that name. Deliverance is in that name. Salvation is in that name. Is there Robo You said that there is no other name whereby men must be saved. And so we thank you, Lord, for the name, the name, the name, the name of Jesus. We honor you for that name today, Father. Thank you, Father God, that I can find my place of rest in that name. I find my place of peace in that name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, we bless you, Lord. We bless you. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, we bless the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Well, God bless you all. You know, if I could sing, sing, I would sing a song that Phoebe used to sing. Thank you. It's just on my heart. I tell you just so many things. It's not a Melvin Henderson concert, though, so I ain't going to do that to y'all. But I promise you, I told God, I said, you've given me so many talents and I haven't been using them. I'm stepping out. I'm coming out. I'm telling you, with my knees knocking, I'm coming out, believing God, that the Spirit of God, you know, I just believe in my heart that if you step out in your area of gifting, that the anointing will just kick in, you know. Sometimes the Spirit of God is like, are you going to move? You're not going to move? Then I ain't going to move. You're going to move? Then I'm going to move. And I just believe that, you know, that there is a place in the presence of God and obedience to God. You know, when you got these gifts and these talents, you better use them. I'm telling you, God wants you to use them. And, uh, yeah, so, what I have may not be much. That's too high. In the eyes of someone else, it may be limited by human frailty. That's all I'm going to say. I'll be up here toe up. Nope, nope, nope. Gotta go. 